remember this, but this month, somewhere right around now, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of Mount Vernon Preschool. And so Tara agreed to, to show up this morning, and I'm going to take this off so you can kind of speak into it with me. Uh, she said she didn't want to speak, so I'm just going to ask some questions. Um, how is it going down there? Um, I think it's going very, very well. In, in, I have to say in a short 10 years, um, time has just blown by. We've started with three students, I believe, our first year um, starting this month, 10 years ago. And from then on, we had a full class, one full class in September, the following September, and then now we've been, I filled, uh, filled the capacity with all five classrooms for the last, I don't know, six or seven years. So it's been so absolutely wonderful. Kids? Um, at presently, we have 91. We usually have between 90 and 100. Amazing. Yeah. And that would be like roughly 50, 60 families? About? Um, even more, probably more. closer to 80 families. 80 families. Okay. Yes. So do you still like what you're doing? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I ask that um, because I've worked with several preschool directors, and we are blessed to have Tara here. So we just want to make sure you, you're still enjoying it. You... Uh, I couldn't think of a better job. I. I, I uh, spend time with some of my friends, and they have office jobs and doing worthwhile things, but when we get together, I just beam about my job. I truly feel the love down there. It's just a wonderful environment. I love it. Tara, what Thanks. makes, I mean, there's tons of preschools around. Is there anything in particular that makes Mount Vernon Preschool special or unique, different? Uh, I think we have a lot of things that make us unique, and, and families really feel that when they come into the building, but first of all, I'd have to say our staff. Our teachers are phenomenal. They, they give 110% every day. We have a lot of, you can imagine with um, about 100 students, we have a lot of different um, obstacles to overcome. For instance, uh, you know, not everyone is, is, is average. So we have learners in the high end and the low end and, and behavior issues and all kinds of things. And they just give their, pour their hearts and souls into, into their classrooms and their kids. Um, another thing that we have that's pretty uh, special is our connection with the church. Pastor Bob, we've had, before Pastor Bob, we had Pastor Dave and Pastor Jerry. They just visit, come and visit the kids and do chapel time and really have that connection. It's really, really wonderful. Um, and then, of course, the support of the church with festivals and all the different things that happen and go on. It's wonderful. Um, I think also I have to say that the building, the, the education building is so wonderful. When parents walk in, that's the first thing they see, their first impression. Um, this great building that, that you've built is just phenomenal, and, and it's so well maintained and clean. Um, that really gives, shows people what, um, kind of gives them a first impression that there's better things to come. I mean, then they get to meet the staff and all that great stuff, so. Yeah. One, one more quick question, and I didn't tell you I was gonna ask you this ahead of time, but, um, so how many of you here do not have a preschool age child? <laughs> Quite a few of us. If you, we do not want this to be a ministry that we just say, okay, here, Terry, you go ahead and do this. If we were to say to you, what could we do to help make the preschool even better or to help you out or teachers out, anything come to mind that we might be able to do to help you do what you do better? Um, I don't know. I think that uh, anyone that has a little bit of time to spare, we can always use a little help here and there. Um, I think spreading the word about our school. Um, we, we generally, in this area, there's a lot of competition, so get the word out. Um, if you're in any um, blogs or mom's groups or anything like that, um, really that is how we get our new students. Um, so yeah, just spreading the word how wonderful we are down there. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, on, on behalf of the congregation, this is for you, just to, to thank you for all that you do um, for that preschool, um, and know that we're, we're praying for you all the time. So thanks for what you do. Let's get started. Any other announcements that need to be? Gene, go ahead. Hi, uh, looking for a few minutes to help with the gossip this Friday. Uh, see me uh, Okay, men interested in helping with the Gopi Friday, see Gene. Yes? To celebrate preschool, we have a cake. Thank you so much. Cake in the fellowship hour to celebrate our preschool. Anything? 
Yes, I didn't say when we would eat. We will figure that out. I did get your email. I'm not sure if we're going to eat before or after. Somebody needs to tell me when we're going to do that. So, um, anything else? All right. Let's quiet our hearts. Put aside just a crazy week. If you were home with kids um, a little more than you anticipated this week, put that out of your mind and let us come together as the body of Christ so that we might worship together. Good morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth and all that is in it, you do not live in temples built by hum human. You do not need the service of our hands. Therefore, inspire within us a right approach to your most holy worship. 
We thank you, we praise you for making yourself known to us by becoming flesh in Jesus Christ, your son, thus opening a new and a living way to you. We thank you that what many prophets and kings desire to see and hear, we have seen and heard in your son, Jesus Christ. You desire to transform all who believe in, you, in him into his likeness. We adore your unsearchable wisdom and mercy. We also praise you for our salvation and the hope of eternal life. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And the congregation say, Amen. Our Bible reading for today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, 3 to 9. I read, We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't we impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why I respond, says the Lord. It is because you are fasting to please yourself, even while you fast. You keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting? When you keep on fight, fighting and quarreling, this kind of fasting Will, not, will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourself by going through the motions of penitence, bowing your head like reeds bending in the wind. You, you dress in ball and, over, and cover yourself with ashes. Is this what you call in fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Listen to the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the claim that bind people. Share your food with the angry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Then you sh your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of God will protect you from behind. Then, when you call the, the Lord, with, the Lord will answer, yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your fingers and spreading vigorous rumors. I repeat the nine. Then, when you call the Lord, will answer. Yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing fingers and spreading vigorous rumors. Amen.
with the boys and girls. Come on down front and join me for the children's sermon, please. Do you guys here today? Yeah. Come on down. I'm going to have you guys sit over here today, okay? Just so we don't get any stones flying around worship space this morning, all right? Over here, over here, over here. Come on over here, guys. On this side. This side, over here. Okay, good job. So do you know what Ash Wednesday was besides a day off from school? Were you guys home on Wednesday? Yeah. Yeah, what, what holiday is Ash, was Ash Wednesday? Do you know? No? If I were to take what I have in this dish here, and if I were to put it on your forehead in the shape of a cross, would you know what day Wednesday was? What was it? Ash Wednesday. Have you guys ever heard of Ash Wednesday before? Ash Wednesday is a day, and, and if you guys want me to do this, I would do it before you leave today. We take ashes. These are ashes from, from old palm branches. They get burned, and then we, pastors take the ashes, and we make them make a sign of the cross and put it on everybody's forehead. No, there's tons of ashes here. I won't run out. And, and we say something. When pastors do that, we say, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. What does that mean? Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. What do you think that means? We kind, our bodies turn into ashes when we die. Do you, death is not something we like talking about, is it? It's, it's not fun to talk about death. Caitlin's grandpa just died this past week. And your grandpa died this past week, right? Yeah. His name was Papa. He was a great Papa, wasn't he? He was. He was a good man. So what happens when we die? Your, your great-grandpa died? Yeah. What happens when we die? Does anybody know? You go up into the clouds. Maybe your spirit goes up into the clouds. What? You... Okay, your body can be buried, or sometimes people can take your ashes and just put them someplace that you really like. Yeah? yeah? Godfather. Your godfather? Yeah. My godfather's dog. Your godfather's dog, okay. Yeah. Uh huh. You know, people ask me all the time because of my job, so what happens when we die? And you know what? We don't know. We have no idea what happens to people when we die. But we do know this. God will take care of us. God will somehow take care of us and make sure that when our bodies are not here, we are still at peace and we're safe and we have nothing to be afraid of. Sometimes we talk about it in terms of heaven, a place where, where we all go and where we'll all be together someday down the road. And it's a beautiful place. The Bible sometimes talks about it as a place where streets are paved with gold and we don't have any fear or any, we don't cry anymore. You're never sad. Do you guys know my son right here? His name is Stefan. When he was little, he used to ask me about heaven and he used to say to me, Dad, are there going to be lawn mowers in heaven? Because he loved cutting the lawn. And you know what I would say to him? If that's what makes you happy, that's what's going to be in heaven. So whatever makes you happy, whatever makes your grandpa happy, whatever makes you feel comfortable and happy and at peace, that is what happens when we die. Because God always takes care of us. Okay? So remember that. Sometimes we get sad when we lose people we love, but we can find some joy knowing that they're at peace and they're with God. Let's pray, and then you guys can go back to your seats. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much that you take care of us in this life and whatever comes after this life. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, thanks. You can go back to your seats.
Please be seated. This morning's second reading comes to us from the 11th chapter of Mark's Gospel. Listen for what the Spirit might have to say to you today. Then they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you, you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and scribes heard this, they kept looking for a way to kill Jesus. For they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples left and went out of the city. Friends, this is the word of the Lord and the poetry of the faithful. Thanks be to God. Well, I don't know if it's my knee or the weather or the combination of both, but over the past few weeks, I've never felt so old. (laughs) I'm making great progress with this knee, but I have to say that it's taking longer than expected, and so when I said something to my physical therapist this last Friday, you can pretty much guess his response. Well, the older we get, the slower (laughs) our bodies heal. Then yesterday, Um, I came downstairs dressed in a sweatsuit that Shan got me for Christmas, and my wonderful oldest son here looked at me and said, you look like you belong in Florida in that outfit. (laughs) The icing on the cake was that someone sent me an email this week with all kinds of rude comments about age. Do you know how to prevent sagging? Just eat. You can fill out all the wrinkles. I've still got it, but no one wants to see it. Don't let aging get you down. It's too hard to get back up. And my favorite, as we get older, our memory isn't just as sharp as it used to be. And my favorite, as we get older, our memory just isn't as sharp as it used to be. So even though we had to cancel our Ash Wednesday service, I've been reminded all week that I am indeed dust, and to dust one day I will return. This morning we're in Mark's Gospel. Mark is the earliest of the four Gospels in Christian Scripture, believed by most to have been written no later than 40 years after the life of Jesus. So he's telling us what people were saying and thinking about Jesus somewhere around 70 A.D., And like most of Scripture's retelling of history, his account is a combination of both history remembered and history interpreted. We're going to be looking throughout this season of Lent at various stories in Mark's Gospel, primarily because it is easy for us to do that. Mark chronicles Jesus' last week on earth on a day-by-day basis. He presents Jesus' final seven days like a great journey, a journey that we can take even today, walking in his footsteps, learning from all of the things he taught his followers until we finally arrive at that empty tomb on Easter Sunday. So I invite you on this journey following the path that Jesus took to the cross so that together we might deepen our appreciation and understanding of what happened 2,000 years ago. 
Because the depth of our Easter celebrations will be directly related to the depth of our Lenten practices. The more committed we are to allowing ourselves to delve into the journey that Jesus took as he moved toward the cross, the more profound our joy will be on Easter Sunday. So our journey begins today on the Monday of Holy Week. In this stunning, memorable story, we see Jesus angry. We see Jesus behaving in a more violent way than we see him anywhere else in Scripture. But before we get there, let's think a little bit about Lent, because that is the place to begin. The season of Lent runs how many days? 40 days. It's technically 46, but they don't count. The church decided not to count Sundays. So it's, it's technically 40 days. To commemorate what? Do you know? The 40 days that Jesus was out in the wilderness, immediately following his baptism. He went into the wilderness for 40 days, where scripture says he was tempted several times by God. The, the term Lent means spring. The term Lent means spring. And that's important because it gives us a slightly different angle on what this season is really all about. When Jesus was in the wilderness, most would say he probably struggled physically. And that's what kind of gave birth to the practice in many parts of Christendom today to give things up for Lent, like chocolate or coffee, or if you're a kid, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, something like that. It was a way of symbolizing, and still is for many people today, a way of symbolizing our contriteness of heart, or to plead with God for some kind of divine grace and forgiveness. But that kind of a fast is only part of the disciplines of this season of Lent. They are valuable. They are meaningful disciplines at times. That kind of giving things up but they never are the sole means by which we move closer to God. Lent is also springtime. It's a time of anticipation. Pope Francis, perhaps you saw, just this past week, said this about the season of Lent. Quoting the early Christian mystic, John Chrysostom, he says, no act of virtue can be great if it is not followed by advantages for others. So no matter how much time we spend fasting, he said, no matter how much time we sleep on a hard floor or eat ashes, sigh continually, if we do no good to others, we do nothing great. Spring reminds us of the hopefulness of this season. And so in the Protestant church, there is less emphasis on eating less and more emphasis on doing more. Many see Lent as a time where we truly do try to care for others, doing something extra in response to God's love for us. Our theology our theology in the Protestant church does not have to begin with sin and with penitence. We can acknowledge on Ash Wednesday with people around the world, with Christians in every part of our planet, that all humanity is indeed dust and that to dust we all shall return while at the same time not forgetting that our primary identity is that of a beloved child of God, unconditionally cared for and mercifully claimed and embraced. That's another way to remember this season. And it involves not, not so much trying to get God to change God's opinion of us, but rather it's about 
allowing God's opinion of us to change us. So with that in mind, we now go with Jesus on the Monday of Holy Week to the temple in Jerusalem. In this passage, Mark 11, we discover that Jesus becomes angry, condemning and overturning tables of the merchants, throwing out those who are selling doves or whatever other animals may have been available for sacrifice. He's condemning them. Why? Well, most scholars are convinced that Jesus was reacting to what had become of the temple. You see, the temple was believed to have been the house of God on earth. Nothing new about that. It was supported by people throughout the nation. They looked upon it with the utmost pride and affection. They gave taxes willingly. They made tithes, all to keep up the beauty and the glory and the majesty of this temple, the house of God. But under Herod, the temple, interestingly, had been renovated. And what Herod did was he add what is known as the court of the Gentiles. Now, the entire temple was considered to be holy. And the farther you moved into the temple, the holier the space became. So the Gentiles, or the non-Jews, they could only go so far. They could only go into this outermost court known as the court of the Gentiles. And that's where Jesus was. That's where all of the activity in this morning's passage was taking place. Now, what Herod had done when he rebuilt this portion of the temple was to erect a large golden eagle on top of the gate that took you into this portion of the temple. And it was put there, this large eagle was put there not only as a symbol of the god Jupiter, but because it was the symbol of Rome. It was put there to reassure Caesar Augustus that this giant, beautiful edifice was not some kind of anti-Roman building, but rather a pro-Roman temple. Not in any way seeking to challenge the authority of Rome or the Roman Empire. But as Jesus walks in, as any if, if any of us had walked in, the question dangling right in front of our eyes as we walked through those gates, the question that hit people right between the eyes when they entered, including Jerusalem, or excluding, including Jesus on this Monday of Holy Week, the question is this. Is this the house of Jupiter or the house of of God. Is this the house of Rome? Or is this the house of Yahweh? That's, I think, the first thing that got Jesus' ire up. Who is this temple honoring? Second, upon his arrival, it became very clear to him that there was a great deal of materialism that had found its way into the court. The selling of animals to be used for sacrifices at exorbitant prices, at prices far higher than they could have gotten in other parts of the town, that was offensive to Jesus. The merchants were only there to make a profit. They had bought into the economic practices of the day and the price gouging that took place in the temple courts made a mockery of the whole sacrifice system. People were being scammed. And Jesus knew this. He was simply put off by all the injustice that had become commonplace right within the temple walls. What Jesus saw was that these sacrificial rituals, their rites of worship, they had actually become more important 
than justice. People were more concerned with the ritual of sacrifice than the more important issue of the day, which was economic justice for the people in the town. And we know this. We know this because of the phrase he uses. What does he call them? Den of... Den of thieves. Now, most of us wouldn't know this. I confess, I didn't know this until just this past week. What Jesus is doing there is recalling a phrase that was used by the prophet Jeremiah in the Hebrew scripture. In Jeremiah chapter 7, the Hebrew people are confronted with this question. Does divine worship excuse you from divine justice? That's the question that comes to us from the seventh chapter of Jeremiah. Do you think, Jeremiah says, that all God requires is regular attendance in God's temple rather than equitable distribution of God's land? And in verse 11, Jeremiah puts this question into the mouth of God. Has this house which is called by my name, become a, become a den of robbers? Now the Jews of the day, they would have been familiar with that story. They would have known that phrase. And that is what Jesus is hearkening back to. That is what has him so outraged. When he sees the eagle, the sign of Rome, when he sees the people's materialism, when he's reminded of the power and the authority of the empire and an economic system that is disenfranchising so many people, when he sees their preoccupation with making money within the temple, he's outraged. And then to make matters worse, worse he looks at his own people's participation in that system. Making sacrifices while at the same time neglecting the poor and the outcast of the day and he is just downright ticked off. Over and over again, friends, throughout the Bible, we see God rejecting people's worship because of their lack of justice. It's never the other way around, interestingly. God never rejects people's justice because they're failing to worship. But over and over again, he rejects their worship because of their failure to do justice. In Amos, I hate your festivals I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, God says. Even though you offer me burnt offerings, I will not accept them. Take away the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Do you see what he's saying? In Micah, which Mary read for us just last week, with what shall I come before the Lord? With burnt offerings? Nonsense. This is what the Lord requires. Seek justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly with God. And it's at the heart of Isaiah's message as well, particularly the one that Frank read for us earlier this morning. How relevant for this season of Lent. Did you catch the point of what he was saying? The fast that I choose, God says in Isaiah, is not about wearing sackcloth and ashes. It's about loosing the bonds of injustice. That's the fast that I desire. He comes right out and says it. That is the fast that I desire. Letting the oppressed go free. Sharing your bread with the hungry. Bringing the homeless into your home. Again, let me be clear. Fasting is not a bad thing. And there's a place for every activity in which we engage that might ultimately move us 
closer to God. But friends, all those religious activities can never become substitutes for the deep and abiding obedience to which every one of us is called. May we never, may we never so trivialize our commitment to the God of the universe so as to think he is more concerned with our not eating fish on Friday than caring for the poor. May we never so trivialize our walk with the maker of the universe to think that he is more honored in our giving up a latte for 40 days than visiting those who are in prison, caring for the widow or the orphan. In this morning's passage, what Jesus is really saying is that worship, you're not going to hear too many pastors say this, I don't think, that worship in the house of God can never become a substitute for justice in the land of God. And when he uses that phrase, den of robbers, according to Marcus Borg and Dominic Crossan in the last week, Jesus is playing off that idea that a den is like a place of hiding. Think about that. What he's saying in calling his people de a den of robbers, he's saying you cannot hide in your places of worship. You cannot think that all of your rituals can in any way become a substitute for the real call of the gospel. I don't get a pass on the command to seek justice just because I preach here every Sunday morning. Choir members, you don't get a command on the pass on the command to, to feed the poor just because you come to rehearsal on Thursday night and sing on Sunday morning. Elders, we don't get a pass on Jesus' command to make justice flow down like waters just because we go to a monthly session meeting. Forgive my passion. But the last week of Jesus' life, his passion. It was harsh. The journey to the cross, the path to Calvary, it's not easy. But I think God is far more willing to accept our stumbling along that difficult path so that we might remain faithful to his call, even our falling down, than he is in any attempt to try to simplify the call. And I do think, I do think he would be outraged even today at our attempts to hide in here, within these four walls, at the expense of serving and being the church out there. Our religiosity can never become a substitute to our striving to become God's transforming agents in the world. That's what frustrated Jesus that Monday of Holy Week. That's why he was so outraged in the temple. I don't care how old I am. This journey that we're all on with Jesus toward the cross, this journey to get closer and closer to God is one that we cannot afford to skip. And while it's not always going to be easy, and while we may stumble along the way, we've got one another. So let's never give up. Let's never try to simplify the call and make it so easy that faith just loses any meaning. So hope loud. Dream big. Dare to imagine. And together, let's journey through this Lenten season right on up to the joy 
and the power of Easter. Friends, it's not about our religious rituals. It's about walking in the way of Christ in the world. God, the message of Monday, that Monday of Holy Week, is a hard one. Convict us. It's so easy for us to see the religiosity of others, the hypocrisy in those people milling around that court of the Gentiles. It's so easy for us to look at them and see all that they miss, while at the same time neglecting the darkness of our own hearts, the superficiality of our own faith. God, illumine that this morning. And as we begin this Lenten season, start a process of cleaning us out. Continue the process of transforming our hearts, our minds, so that we might be people seeking justice the way Jesus did. For this we ask by the power of your Holy Spirit and through the Christ, the Savior. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite the ushers forward to receive the morning. What a downer of a message, huh? (laughs) As one who plans worship, you know, every week, my life is about worship. And so when you read, I'm preaching more often to myself than anyone else. And a passage like that is just hard. 
And so to shift from that and now go about the business of the church, it seems rather abrupt, but that's what we, that's what we do here. We did not have an opportunity to install Mary Wildey as an elder uh, last week, and so Mary, I'm going to invite you forward at this time so we can do that this morning and be about the business of this church. Why don't you face the congregation, and as is required by our Constitution, you've heard these before, let me ask Mary the, the questions for all those ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA. And we know how you're going to answer these. That's for sure. Mary, do you trust Jesus Christ, your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church. And through him, believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by these confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity? Will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbor, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, the unity, and the purity of the church, do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, will you? And will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and the justice of Jesus Christ, will you? As we uh, pray for Mary, let me ask you to do something. Why don't you come on right here in the middle of the body, and if we could have um, a couple elders, those who have been ordained, maybe gather around Mary, and then everyone put their hand on the person in front of them so that we extend like this big spider web, praying, praying for Mary here. Gracious God, we thank you for the call that comes to each of us to be your people. To some you have given the gift of teaching, to others you have given the gift of hospitality, to others the gift of leadership. Continue to empower Mary as she seeks to serve you by serving this, your church. Equip her, strengthen her, and give her the courage to speak your word, and to do your will for the glory of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mary, welcome to this ministry that you've been part of before, but that you are entering into yet again. Let's, uh, let's spend a little bit more time in prayer, lifting up any joys and concerns that you might have uh, today. Concerns, celebrations, uh, Kay? Um, we have one, uh, one, two, three, two, three, two, okay. Prayers of rejoicing and prayers of peace and comfort. Okay, Mike? Margaret, Margaret Doherty, charter member of Mount Vernon, just celebrated her 93rd birthday. So we will celebrate her life with Mike and, and all of his family. Sorry, Judy.
What's his first name, Judy? George. George, Judy's brother-in-law, George. We will pray for healing and comfort for him today. Uh, Judy and Daryl just saw somebody in the midst of the storm yesterday, somebody struggling down the road, and they watched two men pull over, help her, and um, hopefully got her home safe and sound. We'll give thanks for people like that. Okay. Not that we're eager to get rid of them, but we will pray that uh, Erica and uh, Eric and Donica make it home with their family back to California. Anything else today? Pardon. Christians uh, around the world, yeah, those and, and people of every faith who are being persecuted because of faith, the wars that are being weight over faith and misunderstanding, Christians, people being persecuted, we will remember them all this morning. Gracious God, Lord of all, King of the universe, we worship you this morning not at the expense of being people who truly want to live the way of Christ, but who supplement that way by coming together, by singing great hymns of our faith that have been sung by people for hundreds of years, by reading scripture and telling stories that have been recounted for generations, by being pushed and challenged through a word that comes to life when we chew on it together. God, may we never neglect our worship. May we never neglect, as Scripture says, the coming together as the body. But it ne may it never be the sole mark of our walks with you. Continue to transform us. And God, during this season of Lent, as we walk with you, journeying toward the cross, teach us, inspire us, motivate us, so that we might live what we say we believe. For the sake of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Please stand now for our closing hymn.
Friends, as you go forth from this place, hope loud, dream big, and dare to imagine. And all God's people agreed and said,